Good morning. Um, and you're here today to listen essentially to um, uh, a praise of his new book published by Verso, The Muslims Are Coming. And in this book, Aaron is basically looking at uh, counter radicalization measures both in the United States and in the UK. You'll hear much more about that in a moment. Um, to Aaron's left is Liz Bikiti, uh, Director of the Institute for Race Relations. Liz is one of the respondents and she's going to talk, uh, as well as responding to what Aaron has to say, she'll also be talking about how the anti-extremism debate uh, locks in and impacts upon the anti-fascist debate. The anti-fascist debate, yeah. Uh, and finally, we, I'm delighted to welcome Asim Qureshi from CAGE. Uh, and Asim is also going to talk about counter-extremism, particularly in the UK, and how the, the strategies of anti-extremism impact on the British Muslim population. So I'm going to now hand over to Aaron, who will speak for 25 minutes. The respondents will speak for 10 minutes. Then we'll open up the floor for our questions and contributions. Thank you very much, Aaron. Wonderful to have you here. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to the, um, to the International State Crime Initiative and the Institute of Race Relations for, um, for organising this. And thanks, thanks to all of you for coming along. Um, so, I... What I thought um, I would do today is, is not so much go into um, a kind of summary of the arguments of the book, um, but start with three kind of personal narratives that, um, that I write about in the book. And, and then out of those, try and um, open up a conversation about this idea of extremism. Okay? Um, so, then, so after kind of talking you through these, these kind of three personal stories, um, I will, I will try and lay out some, some of my thoughts on this concept um, and then um, Liz and Asim are going are gonna to try and pick up that conversation as well. Um, and so it, it, you're not going to get a kind of um, you know, step by step account of some kind of um, systematic analysis. We're going to try and maybe do something that's a bit more kind of ad hoc and um, conversational, right? Um, and because I think I think the question of extremism is um, something that is a useful way into a lot of different topics, right? It's questions to do with with the war on terror and how we understand um, the causes of terrorism within that. Questions to do with surveillance. Questions to do with how we think about the far right um, and and um, you know very immediate political questions that come out of recent news events like the. Um, you know, for example, the recent story about Tommy Robinson um, and, and his supposed conversion um, through his, his um, involvement with the Quillian Foundation. Right? So it's kind of a lot of different strands to this that, that I don't think we necessarily need to bring together into a coherent part. Okay, so um, just to begin with just a word about um, the background to, to the, the book that, that I've written. Uh, in 2002, I spent a year traveling around the United States, um, spending time in um, Texas, Virginia, Minnesota, New York, Washington, Michigan, doing interviews with um, people who work for the FBI on counterterrorism, people who work for um, uh, local police departments, um, security officials in the Department of Homeland Security, people at the National Security Council, and um, people. In, um, in Muslim American communities who are active on these kinds of issues, and um, a small number of people who have been labelled as so-called Islamic extremists um, as well. And I spent um, some time travelling around England, uh, spending some time in Bradford, Birmingham, Luton, Bolton, um, doing similar kinds of, of research. So the book, the book kind of comes out of those um, conversations and those, and those travels. Um, so, so as I said, I'm going to I'm going to give you three stories about three individuals, okay? Um, uh, two of which two of which I interviewed, and the third who um, who I interviewed his family. So the first story is, is a guy called um, Jesse Curtis Morton, um, who whom I interviewed in early 2011, shortly before he was arrested. So Jesse Curtis Morton, um, he talks about when he was growing up in America in the 1980s um, that he didn't have cable television. He says, when I was a child, the new wave was MTV, and I didn't have access to it. 
and I think it's a major reason why I had some level of human consciousness as I grew up, and I could see through the lies and the hypocrisies of my own society from the beginning. Jesse hated the consumerism that he thought had brainwashed his fellow students at his working class high school. He says, they watch their favourite TV show and they eat their favourite cereal and they buy their favourite shoes and that's what life's about. I think they're sick. I was never part of it. Jesse left home at an early age to escape an abusive family. For a while he travelled with the Grateful Dead. Uh, he was attracted to the, kind of, the band's kind of rejection of materialist, materialist values. And then by 2002 he was struggling with drug addiction and um, in Virginia he was charged with petty larceny and possession of crack cocaine. Within a few years he converted to Islam, graduated from college and earned a master's degree from Columbia University. He described his first reading of the Quran as an overwhelming epiphany and his subsequent conversion seemed to have given him a sense of focus and discipline. He changed, he changed his name to Yunus Abdullah Muhammad and found work as a substance, a substance abuse counsellor in New York City. He also spent time in Saudi Arabia. To his dismay, he, he encountered the same materialism that had alienated him from United States society. He came to believe that the commercialism that was rampant in America was being imposed around the world. But he also started to think that Islam, the religion that had saved him from drug addiction, would, if properly followed, save the world from Western capitalism. So this kind of, um, I guess, compared to the way most American Muslims think about Islam, kind of very offbeat interpretation of Islam that he followed, where it kind of fuses this kind of revolutionary anti-globalist politics with, with a sort of religious conservatism, um, is, is very uh, unique in a way to him and a small number of others that he associated with. Um, now to take his ideas forward, he, he set up an organisation called Revolution Muslim. This was launched in December 2007 and was mainly operating through a website. Uh, he posted videos which celebrated the 9 11 attacks and he posted um, quite detailed accounts of the kinds of social and economic policies that he wanted to implement. Uh, he would be found um, trying to recruit followers um, outside the Islamic Cultural Center on New, New York's Upper East Side. Um, but you know, the, the congregants leaving the mosque would basically ignore him and, and his speeches. In April 2010, one of the bloggers on his website um, heard about a forthcoming episode of the television series South Park, in which the Prophet Muhammad was to be depicted wearing a bear suit. Um, a graphic picture of the murdered Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh was posted on the site, accompanied by a prediction that the programme's writers would probably suffer a similar fate. Details of the neighbourhood where the, the South Park writers lived in Colorado were added with the suggestion that readers pay a visit. And this, uh, this posting on this website was, was um, very quickly picked up by the mainstream news media, um, who obviously had a field day um, with it, and, um, and so then Revolution Muslim becomes one of the top um, most searched for phrases on Google for, for a few days. So Abdullah Mohammed is, is now kind of inundated with calls from journalists and so he decides to issue a, a kind of statement trying to clarify things, but his statement doesn't really clarify anything at all. He says, um, we're not trying to directly incite violence, but then he quotes Osama bin Laden saying, if there is no check in the freedom of your words, then let your hearts be open to the freedom of our actions. Three months later, he quits his job in New York and leaves for Morocco, where he's um, arrested and extradited to the United States and charged with conspiracy to solicit the murder of his fellow citizens. He's held in solitary confinement for a number of months, um, agrees to take a plea bargain with the government rather than risk a trial, and he's sentenced to 11 and a half years in prison. So, um, and you know, the United States is a society where um, online threats of violence are, you know, a, a tolerated up to the point where you can make a case that there might be some immediate, um, imminent lawless action, is the legal phrase, flowing from it. Um, uh, but, but, so the, the kind of length of his sentence that he receives for this is, is kind of quite striking. The reason is, is fairly obvious. Um, he, he embodies the threat that many in the, in the US national security apparatus most fear, um, a white American who rejects the society in which he's raised and becomes an admirer of its most feared enemy, Osama bin Laden. Um, now, 
you know, it's, it's kind of easy to think of, of kind of psychological theories to explain this um, journey to extremism, if we want to use that word. So you can talk about his abusive upbringing uh, that, that maybe produced a rage in him that was then projected onto American society as a whole. You can think about whether um, his, his way of escaping from drug addiction was to structure his life according to very absolute moral precepts so that he had kind of Manichaean mindset that was vulnerable to imagining these kind of, um, you know, these kind of violent struggles between forces of good and evil. You can think about whether his, his childhood experiences um, gave rise to a kind of failure to adjust to reality so that he had this kind of relentless longing for a utopia in which his life's struggles could be redeemed. And, and maybe those were parts of, of what was going on for him. Um, but there's kind of a bigger question as well, um, which is why his ideological journey took the particular form it did, right? Because there's all kinds of ways that you can think about absolute good and evil. Um, so, and to answer that, I think you need to start by looking at the way his own beliefs mirrored the war on terror's own kind of clash of civilizations narrative, right? So it seems that he accepted at face value the official narrative um, that, that something called radical Islam was an existential threat to an American society that he had come to despise, and he seems to have acted on that basis. So what he's doing is merely kind of wrenching the labels of good and evil from the official war on terror discourse and inverting their positions. Um, so the second story I want to tell takes place in Manchester. Um, so this happens in April 2010. Um, when Israel's Deputy Ambassador to the UK, um, Talia Lador Fresher, is invited to speak at the university. And um, student activists in Manchester are planning to um, come to her lecture and confront her. This is very soon after the um, Operation Cast Lead, um, in which the Israeli Defence Forces um, devastate Gaza. But there's strict security arrangements, so they're not able to come into the lecture. And, um, and so they gather outside the, the car park to where in the university, hoping to um, challenge her as her car leaves the car park, which they do. Um, and so you have a moment where the car pushes through um, this, this crowd of protesters um, and, and, then, and then drives off. But in the midst of that, at one point, there's a 17-year-old um, student called Jamil Scott, who is lifted onto the hood of the car momentarily um, and um, has a kind of minor limp as a result. Um, and, um, and so this protest um, provokes a furious reaction from the, uh, Israel's ambassador to the UK, Ron Prosser, who says, what is going on at British taxpayer-funded universities is shocking. Extremism is not just running through these places of education, it is galloping. My ears are ready and waiting to hear the strongest condemnation of this behaviour, both from the heads of campus and the local authorities. So shortly after this, Jamil is arrested by um, Greater Manchester Police on suspicion of racially aggravated public disorder. And the allegation being made by the um, Israeli Deputy Ambassador is that Jamil threw himself at the car's windscreen while chanting anti-Semitic slogans. Um, th there's, a, there's a security guard at the university who was a witness to everything who, who contradicts that account and the charges are dropped. But what happens next is that um, Officers of the Northwest Counter Terrorist Unit at Greater Manchester Police turn up at Jamil's home and they tell him that they're referring him to something called the Channel Project because they consider him vulnerable to Islamist or far left radicalisation. He's told he's going to be on this project for two to three years, but if, if his behaviour improves, he'll be left alone after a year. As part of the um, Channel Project, he's told that he's going to receive counselling from two officers of the Counter Terrorist Unit. Um, and they meet with him at his aunt's house in order to discuss their concerns about what they call his political trajectory. Um, they say they're worried that Jamil's been on a political demonstration at a very young age, uh, and conversations focus on um, who, he's, who he's associating with. Right? So he's a member of the Socialist Workers' Party, they have a lot of questions about um, other members of the party and, um, and their polit political opinions. They, um, they ask if he's being groomed by older people um, and they build up a whole profile of his entire life. Um, his parents, his aunt and his college are all contacted repeatedly by these officers in an effort to put pressure on Jamil to end his political activism. Um, so they visit his school before left-wing demonstrations in Manchester and um, 
advise, advise him not to attend and not to talk to other students about politics. Uh, when his political science class has a, has a visit planned to the Conservative Party conference in Manchester, um, the police get the teachers to, um, to prevent him from attending. Um, and, and they also phone his mother and say to, say to her that she should uh, move to a new neighbourhood where, where he won't be under the influence of these other political activists and they offer to arrange for the um, for local authority housing department to rehouse the family. So this is, this is how Jamil described his experience. It was bullshit. It was completely and utterly exaggerated but scary at the time. I was bemused by the whole two-year process. It was quite clear that I wasn't in the terrorist category, but I was told that I'm being monitored and mentored by an anti-terrorist project. This was an attempt at depoliticization, spreading fear and making people actually feel unsafe around their neighbors. I remember being quite offended by the fact that I'd made a political choice to actually engage with politics, and the people who I actually talk and discuss with are being accused of grooming me for future political extremist activity. The officers were always trying to be mentors and role models. Obviously, I didn't appreciate it because I didn't need mentoring or role modeling. I was just exercising my right to protest. Now, um, through a, a sort of fairly long legal process that was supported by um, the Civil Liberties Organization Liberty, I was able to use the Freedom of Information Act to establish that between 2007 and 2010, 1,120 individuals were, were identified by this channel project as potentially travelling on a pathway of radicalisation. Of these, 290 were under 16 years old and 55 were under 12. Over 90% were Muslim, the rest were mainly identified for potential involvement in far-right extremism. By the end of 2012, almost 2,500 people had been identified by this channel project as possible risks. And it's worth, it's worth pointing out that the Channel Project is designed to identify and intervene with young people who, by definition, are not suspected of involvement in any crime. Okay. So, um, so the third story, the third story I want to tell is um, of an African-American Muslim from Detroit called Abdullah Lachman. Uh, he was the imam of a mosque on Detroit's impoverished west side. Every Sunday, he and his followers would run a soup kitchen uh, providing for the basic needs of the local community. This is a neighbourhood where um, most of the buildings are derelict and empty and then interspersed you'll see um, homes where two or three families will be sharing that space because they can't afford to pay the rent on a home for themselves. Um, and, and in this landscape, Imam Lukman is a kind of familiar face. Um, his son, Omar Regan, told me that um, his father's favourite word was grassroots. That's how my dad would talk. He's from back in the 60s. Um, now, um, Abdullah had converted to Islam in the early 1980s um, and was a follower of someone called Jamil Alamin, who you might be familiar with under his previous name, um, H. Rap Brown, uh, one of the uh, leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, so Rap Brown was one of the kind of black revolutionaries from the 60s who was um, eventually imprisoned on incitement to riot charges and converted to Islam in, in prison in New York in 1971. Um, and, and so Imam Lukman is one of the people who's um, organising for him to be released uh, from prison. Um, now by the time you get to the war on terror in 2001, um, the, uh, the uh, Omar, as Omar Regan, the son, puts it, um, Lukman Abdullah is unfinished business from um, the days of COINTELPRO. COINTELPRO is the program in the 1960s run by the FBI to target um, all kinds of dissidents and political activists, including uh, Black Panther Party, um, Puerto Rican independence movement, uh, New Left, etc. Okay? Um, and so, um, after 9-11, the FBI are categorizing Abdullah as what they call a highly placed leader of a nationwide radical fundamentalist Sunni group consisting primarily of African Americans who uh, call on their followers to an offensive jihad rather than a defensive jihad in order to establish a se separate sovereign Islamic state within the borders of the United States governed by Sharia law. Right? So the implication there is that he shares an ideology with Al-Qaeda. Um, now, there's little doubt that Imam Lukman viewed the US government as an oppressor and called on his followers to organize against it. Like the Black Panther Party, 
uh, members of this mosque also carried guns. Uh, but there's no evidence of any plot to carry out any kind of terrorist attack. Really, you're just talking about kind of small-time hustlers in this impoverished neighborhood um, struggling to pay the bills while denouncing America. In 2007, the FBI began a, a sting operation um, targeting the Imam's Mosque. I won't go into the details of the operation, but essentially the FBI paid very large sums of money to lure those around Imam Luqman into helping fence stolen goods so that eventually he could be placed in a warehouse in, in Dearborn near Detroit um, when the time comes for the FBI to carry out a raid. And then on the morning of October 28, 2009, <coughs> Um, 60 law enforcement officers uh, surround this warehouse, including um, uh, officers of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, I'm not sure why they're there, um, and at a pre-arranged time, um, three informants exit the warehouse, expose the off as a distraction, and a dozen federal agents um, approach the Imam and his colleagues in order them to, to show their hands and get down on the floor. Accounts of what happened next differ, but most likely the FBI agents suspect that um, the Imam has a gun um, and they release a dog that's been trained to grab at the Imam's arm. The dog bites at the Imam's face, the Imam shoots the dog, and the federal agents return fire and kill him instantly. Um, and as, as the Imam's body's lying on the floor, they handcuff it um, while the police dog is evacuated by helicopter for possible life-saving treatment. Um, so there's little doubt that, that um, had the government chosen not to infiltrate this mosque and entrap um, the Imam in a, in a criminal conspiracy of its own invention, that he'd still be alive. Okay, so um, we've got three cases here of, um, in, of individuals that in various ways have been labelled as extremists, um, and three, three examples of um, responses to them from, the, um, from government authorities of various kinds. So what I want to do, just to, just to kind of close off this introductory part, is to just to spend a short while thinking about um, this concept of extremism, which, which has obviously become a kind of key anchoring term for the war on terror. Um, so, the, in the war on terror, there's essentially two ways in which people think about extremism, right? There's a, by and large, um, a, an analysis that comes from conservatives, by and large, that thinks of Islam as an inherently extremist religion, right? And this is what you you get from people like Bernard Lewis, Samuel Huntington, it's the clash of civilizations narrative. I mean, it's something that I think a lot of us are very familiar with and we've understood it, and it's been very clearly discredited. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, because actually I think that is now peripheral to how governments operate and think, right? Much more um, influential and um, important, I think, for us to think about politically is um, how liberals understand extremism, right? Um, and so I think the prevailing way in which liberal discourse understands extremism is to think of um, a, um, a division between moderate Islam and extremist Islam. Right? So the problem is no longer with Islam itself, but with some extremist interpretation of Islam. Um, and, and so on that model then, the root cause of terrorism is this particular extremist religious ideology. Okay? So that's a, um, a kind of key idea. Now, a number of things um, happen when you have that starting assumption that I won't just run through quickly. So the first thing is, it, is that it sets up a field of academic study, right? Because you can then create um, academic models that try to trace how someone goes from being the moderate Muslim to the extremist Muslim. These are so-called radicalization models, right? So we have this word radicalization that we never had um, you know, more than 10 years ago to try and understand terrorism, but now it's become the main lens through which we try and understand terrorism. What is the process of radicalization? Is this person radicalized, right? Um, so we have these academic radicalization models that try and trace this process, right? And they usually talk about um, like ideology, so extremist ideology is the root cause here that makes someone into a, into a terrorist. They talk about identity and they talk about psychology. There's some kind of psychological vulnerability, right? Um, and in, in one of the things I do in the book is to kind of try and subject this field of, of academic work to scrutiny. Um, and um, in my analysis, there's a kind of key error in this field, which, which is that it's, the whole field takes as an a priori assumption the, um, the view that religious ideology 
by itself is a cause of violence, right? So that's an assumption rather than something that is actually demonstrated within this field of knowledge. It's an assumption that just gets that field of knowledge up and running. Um, and more widely, it tends to abstract from the political context within which um, violence in, emerges and assumes that extremist ideas are by themselves sufficient explanations for the existence of terrorist violence. So where does this, where does this kind of idea come from, this, this kind of uh, way of thinking about violence where you can um, just explain why violence happens through this notion of extremism and extremist ideas? Um, you, you, you um, get it from the Cold War, right? So in the Cold War analysis of totalitarianism, writers like Hannah Arendt and um, Karl Popper, you have this theme running through their work that, um, that somehow um, what lies behind these kinds of forms of political repression is bad ideas, right? Extremist ideas. Um, and so the idea that there's some kind of extremist mindset within which these ideas capture you and turn you into someone capable of various kinds of political evil. Right? Um, and, and then in the late 60s, um, the word extremist emerges as a word to refer to this same tendency in social movements that the word totalitarianism is, is used to refer to that tendency in states. Okay, so extremism then becomes this, this term that has this currency. And the problem is that it conceals the violence of liberal states themselves, right? And it creates this kind of um, this space of innocence whereby the, the violence <coughs> of liberal states carry out is seen as normal, rational, and necessary, whereas the violence that other political actors carry out is seen as the product of um, a kind of extremist mindset, right? And this is a very limited way to understand political violence, right? Or terrorism, if we want to use that word. Think about um, uh, the history of terrorism in the modern era. Um, uh, what you see is that terrorism does not come out of um, some kind of political radicalization into extremist ideas. You see this repeating pattern where terrorism is the product of a failure of political radicalization. It's a product of moments of political defeat. So think of, um, you know, the first case of modern terrorism is the anarchist bombers in the 19th century. All of them are veterans of the violent suppression of the Paris Commune. It's a moment of political defeat. Think of the provisional IRA in Northern Ireland. It comes out, it's, it's turned to the bombing of civilians, comes out of the failure of the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland to achieve its political goals. Think of the African National Congress. Um, it begins a campaign of disruption and sabotage and bombing um, as a result of the violent suppression of, of the anti-apartheid movement at Sharpeville in 1960. Um, think of the Weather Underground in the early 1970s, this American um, group that, that uh, issues a declaration of state of war against the US government. That's coming out of the context of the suppression of the student movements to end the Vietnam War. Um, and then come forward to, to our time in Britain in the last 10 years. Um, if you look at the, the number of terrorist um, prosecutions from 2003 to 2006, they more than double. Then from 2006 to 2009, they revert to whatever they were at before. Now that isn't entirely to do with the Iraq war beginning in 2003, but that's a large part of the story. You have millions of people come out onto the streets in 2003 who um, who uh, want Tony Blair to withdraw from participating in this war. There's maybe an expectancy that, um, that in, a, in a democracy that number of people on the streets will bring about a shift in, in policy. That doesn't happen. It's a moment of political defeat that for some small number of people then um, creates the idea in their mind that, that um, now violence against their fellow citizens is legitimate. Okay? Um, just very quickly, um, some, some other consequences of thinking about extremism in this way. Um, the, um, in terms of how you respond to extremism, the first thing that you're going to do if you believe that the root cause of terrorism is a certain set of extremist ideas, or how it's sometimes referred to as a virus of extremism, then you're going to, you're going to want to um, have systematic surveillance of the suspect community in order to understand the ideas that are circulating in that. So you, put, you, you, you want to know the religious ideas and the political ideas and opinions that are circulating there. And you want to intervene in that community to stem the circulation of those ideas. And you focus on that rather than thinking about the wider kind of political context within which this, this violence emerges. Okay? And that's what we see with, with, um, with the Jamil Scott story is, is he's getting 
um, entangled in a program that is precisely designed, designed to stem the circulation of certain ideas, um, uh, of, you know, that are defined as extremism. Um, and then you can make, you can tell us a parallel story in relation to thinking about far right extremism. Right. So here, normally, um, when we, the normal narrative around far right extremism nowadays is that in Europe we have a situation where um, we have these fringe. Okay, we have these fringe um, kind of far right groups across Europe, and they are gaining support. Um, why? Because of um, a failure in Europe to um, to give um, the majority populations of Europe a strong sense of positive national identity. Right, so there's the identity narrative, and so then people want to support the far right, and so then. The far right's electoral success drags the mainstream of politics further to the right. That's the sort of standard narrative that you'll hear from liberals about what's going on here, right? When you look at groups like um, the English Defence League, for example, you actually see something different. It's not so much that um, the English Defence League is pulling the, um, the mainstream polit politics further to the right. What's happening is that the, 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 the flow is actually the other way. Um, the English Defence League are um, appropriating ideas that are already in the mainstream. Okay, so if you read the English Defence League website and look at its mission statement, it's very interesting. It uses all the language that you would see in um, in, a, in official government policy in this area. Right, it talks about we don't have a problem with um, with Islam, we don't have a problem with moderate Muslims. We just want to tackle extremist Muslims. It uses the language of human rights. Um, uses the language of women's rights, gay rights. It's straight out of preventing violent extremism policy. All that they do is that they say, um, we don't believe that the government is doing, is fighting this war hard enough, so we, as citizens of this country, will take up our own war on the streets of England. Right? But essentially, the, the framework comes from official discourse. Right? Um, so so um, when you think about so what, what that points to is that in order to understand an organisation like that, it's not enough for us just to have this idea of extremism. We need to understand how these movements um, come out of particular political contexts, right? They're not something outside of the mainstream of liberal politics that infects it from outside, but they're the product of that, that mainstream liberal political context itself, okay? So, so, um, so and finally, um, it's in order to kind of get, get a, an interesting precedent for a different way of thinking about extremism, um, uh, I think it's worth turning to Martin Luther King. Okay? So uh, Martin Luther King um, actually says some very interesting things about um, extremism when he's, um, when he's uh, in Birmingham jail in the early period of the civil rights movement. Um, and he's being accused um, by the um, by predominantly white churches in the South, that he's an extremist for his, his campaign for civil rights. And he says, um, though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Right? So he's doing something very interesting there, of actually saying, okay, I am an extremist, but then he says, I am an extremist for love, and I am ex an extremist for justice. Okay? Um, and then much later on, in, in, in 1967, um, another kind of take on this question of violence and extremism. Right? He's speaking to an audience at Riverside Church, um, and he says, um, it's impossible to condemn without hypocrisy the violence of angry young men within America unless one also condemns the state violence of, um, of our own government. Um, he says, uh, I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. Okay? So he's doing something very important now, I think, for us today, which is to, to show that there's a cycle of violence, right? and there's appropriations of violence between so-called extremists and governments that claim to be fighting extremism. Okay? And I think that's a really important lesson for us today. Thank you.
thank you very much, Aaron. And I'm sure you'll have lots of questions, um, but we'll, we'll hold the questions until after everybody has spoken. So I think Asim will turn to you Me? next. You sure? Mm. Oh, <laughs> right, I was expecting you. I'm, I'm quite pleased because it's very difficult to follow Liz. So, <laughs> so, quite happy. Easy to follow Aaron. Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's another way then. Well, you know, Aaron's book's called Muslims Are Coming, but you know, in many ways I feel like we're already here. <laughs> you know, what, can you, what can you say with to that? I mean, it's interesting that, you know, we talk a lot about the, uh, the discourse around extremism, and recently Boris Johnson made these comments about, you know, us radicals having our Muslims having our children taken away from us. And I very much see him as speaking directly to somebody like me, who's constantly trying to come up against uh, the government's policies around what Muslim identity is and who Muslims should be and how puppety we all are all the time. And my wife actually turns to me and she says, after you know, seeing all the stuff that I sent her, she goes, do you think we should get a divorce? No, seriously, like, you'll make it much harder for them to take our kids away. You know? It was a really kind of funny yet horribly tragic moment at the same time that my wife is actually thinking about kind of counter-counter-terrorism strategies within this context of this, you know, extremism, that she's actually thinking, you know what, there's actually a possibility that they could potentially maybe at some point try and take our kids away. They've already done everything else they said that they were going to do, so why not this as well? And so, you know, it, it, I guess it's just interesting how some of this stuff, it pervades into every single part of your life. You know, the currency with which you know, the base all of this is really, it's, it's a hysterical currency. It's very much based on, on hysteria. And even if you look at the context within which Boris Johnson is speaking, as well, look at, look at the parents of the Woolwich, the, you know, the, the, the Woolwich guys, you know, it's exactly those types of parents. You mean Nigerian Christians, right? <laughs> you know, that, that we need to be tackling. But, you know, he's able to make these statements and every single newspaper across the country replicates that narrative, replicates that rhetoric without even questioning. So everybody else who actually, you know, has half a brain and thought about it for 20 seconds said, hold on a second, their parents were Christian. How can you get away with saying this? But he does get away with it because it's a sound bite. It's one that's very, very easy to pick up on. It's very easy to use. And all of a sudden, everyone's going on about, yes, well, you know, these these, these kids are susceptible to radicalization. They are susceptible to, you know, all of this type of extremism, so we need to take them away. You know, nobody ever talks about the massive positive contribution that, you know, Muslims play within societies in terms of, you know, our children often being extremely well behaved, you know, being, you know, high achievers, you know, playing a lot of, a very, very huge active social role in terms of social activism, social justice, so on and so forth. Nobody ever talks about that. But it's very, very easy within this current climate of fear and hysteria to make uh, a statement like that. And this generally speaks to kind of the way in which government policy seems to be working, which is to kind of scrutinize every single part of, of Muslim life. You know, and, you know, we, they do talk about far right extreme as well, but in all of their policy documents, it is never anything more than lip service. And so I am going to speak about, you know, the overemphasis on Muslims because that's what it is. We see the physical manifestation of that, not only in the way that they conduct their counter-terrorism policy and their counter-extremism policies, but also in terms of the policy documents themselves. The Task Force on Extremism report pretty much solely concentrates on Muslims. Even though they said, well, you know, there was the incident of a man being killed in the street and some bombings by this guy, but you know, we sort of they paid lip service at the beginning, but then go on to totally just speak about about Muslims. And so, Cage, we actually just released a report recently. Sorry, I didn't have any hard copies with me, otherwise I would have brought them. But it was called uh, "The Cradle of Grave Police State," and we analyze prevent really the prevent strategy in relation to the way in which Muslims are having their lives really restricted in so many different ways, whether it's through the channel program so on and so forth. But, you know, when we, when we thought about it, we thought, well, it really is cradle to grave because everything that we thought about, we thought, well, there's a potential for them to actually impact on our lives. So now you have a lot of discussion about circumcision, for example. You have discussions about kosher and halal meat. You have discussions about, you know, the way in which, you know, young men, you know, tolerate other, uh, other sex. And I actually said this to um, the author of the report. There's even a 
the circumstance that I could see prevent actually playing a role in a death. So, for example, um, the family come from a Sufi background. The son of the father who's died, you know, is, should we say, more Salafi inclined. Now you've got a, a conflict between burial practice and the kind of rites that should take place. You know, even more extreme example, the whole family is Shia, the son and the father are maybe Salafi. You've got a massive, you know, uh, issue of ritual practice here. So all of a sudden, the son starts kicking off about the fact that I want it this way because this is the correct way it needs to be. That young man could be reported under the channel program. He could be reported as a potential extremist just because he wants to bury his father in a way that he believes is appropriate to his culture, to, to his re personal religious beliefs. And so you have this kind of ability you know, you know, even you know, we joke about the whole the kids thing, but it's actually been said now. We used to talk about kids as a joke prior to Boris Johnson making the statement. And so I, you know, I can see these crazy scenarios in which actually prevent uh, and channel program and you know the government's wide counterterrorism policy, you know, has an impact on us. But it's not just the this kind of soft edge stuff. This actually has a physical <coughs> manifestation and the hard edge of counterterrorism. So people talk about prevent um, uh, strategy being a policy, but really that policy does manifest itself because, for example, you know the definition of prevent. They say that extremism is I can't remember, maybe I don't really remember it, but it's kind of you criticize, criticize democracy, um, speaking against the armed forces, and so on and so forth. That you know basically you're an extremist. Now they decide at the hard edge of counter-terrorism law, that you are an extremist, what can they do to you? They can take your passport away from you, they can remove your citizenship from you, they can put you under what's known as a TPM, formerly known as control orders. This is an arbitrary decision by the Home Secretary. All she says, all you do is get a letter in the post that says, we believe you're an extremist, and so we're going to deprive you of some form of your liberty, including your own nationality. But what do you mean by extremist then in this circumstance? Because the a definition the only definition exists, that, that exists, exists in the prevent strategy. It's so vague, it's so wide, that actually it becomes almost impossible because she makes the arbitrary decision. Every, the appeal then goes to what's known as SIAC, the Special Immigration Appeals Commission, where they just say, well, sorry, it's national security, it's all under secret evidence, we're not obliged to tell you what the case is against you. And so you've been labeled an extremist without actually having any understanding of not only what the evidence is against you, but how they would come to that conclusion in the first place. So I don't want you to just think or prevent in terms of these soft policies, but actually it has a very, very real impact on, on you know, people's lives, like Mahdi Hashi, like Bilal Burjawi, who was killed in a drone strike. So they, they use it as a way of kind of removing citizenships or putting you under the teeth in. It neutralizes the individual. It's easy for them. It's much easier than trying to uh, secure a conviction for, uh, uh, for some kind of terrorism plot that doesn't exist. They tried that with Rice and it didn't work. They tried it on a number of occasions and each time they failed. And they thought, well, why use the criminal justice system when we can introduce a whole range of sanctions through the civil system? And so, I mean, one of the points that Aaron brought up was one about violence. And it seems that somehow Muslim violence exists in a plane that's very, very different to the, uh, to the rest of the world. So, OK, thank you. Um, and one of the recent examples that, that we've seen is this guy, Abdul Wahid Majid, who uh, in Syria chose to allegedly drive a truck to, to the front gates of an Aleppo prison. Now immediately everything was about suicide terrorists. In fact, even up until now, everything has been about suicide terrorists, uh, you know, does this suicide bombing. Okay, for a start, we don't know his intention because we don't know if he tried to jump out of a truck, nothing along those lines. But let's assume it was a suicide. It was a suicide operation. Why the terrorism? This is the question that I keep coming back to every time. What is the indication? This is a civil armed conflict that's taking place, where a man who, after just after the Carter Rupp released their report about the severe abuses that are taking place in Syria in Syrian prisons, you know, decides to, after a year and a half of the rebel, joint rebel groups trying to attack this prison and liberate the 4,000 people that have been tortured there, decides to drive this truck into it. Now, in any other circumstance, in any conflict anywhere in the world, conflict, that would be seen 
as an operation that's been conducted in order to achieve a military objective. This is exactly how we see. Even the kamikazes were seen that way. They weren't called terrorists. They were seen as, you know, maybe you know, people are a little bit out there, but they were trying to achieve a certain objective in what they were trying to do. The label of terrorism is applied because it's easy to apply. And that's the only reason, because they could construct this narrative about them. There was no indication ever in this circumstance that he ever wanted to attack any civilians, that he ever wanted to, um, you know, kind of use any of the same types of tactics that we normally would like associate with, say, or fight with them. But really that, you know, he, he wanted to achieve that objective, and to some extent he succeeded, to some extent he failed. But there was no indication of terrorism there. And so, what is it about terrorism then, or acts of political violence, that, that we have come to understand? And, you know, I think the three cases that you mentioned really highlight what it is, and that is grievance. That all, all of these people feel a sense of grievance. When you remove that grievance, or when that grievance is reduced, then actually you see that proportionally the risk reduces as well. And it's one of the reasons why I believe that they've got such an overemphasis now on Proven and on Channel. Because actually the same degree of plots and threats that existed before while they were invading Afghanistan and Iraq have considerably gone down. And as the threat has reduced, they've had to invent threats. So these extremists that are somehow coming. And, and so, you know, well, I guess what I want to just end with is trying to give you a picture that all of these policies are not separate from one another. They're all interconnected and they form as part of the package in order to disenfranchise Muslims, to make them feel scared, to try and depoliticize them. You know, so often I hear people, you know, I was once on the phone to an, uh, to an intern who was doing some piece of research for me, and his mother grabs the phone out of his hands and starts shouting at me, saying, you know, can you stop getting my son to look at all this stuff about, you know, people being detained around the world? You know, what if he gets arrested? You know, and when you think about it, actually, if they wanted social cohesion, if they wanted people to feel, feel part of the society, then actually they should allow them to air their grievances, allow them to take part, allow them to use civil society to make a change. But what they're doing is actually saying, there's no place for you to talk about what your grievances are. There's no place. There's just no place for you in society. If you've got a problem, then you've got to change yourself. It's not about us, it's completely about you. Change yourself, otherwise you're not welcome. Thank you. Please. <laughs> um, I feel um, a bit of a fraud because um, Aaron's written a book on this subject um, as seen written in various pamphlets and I've just written a, a very short comment piece that went on the Institute of Race Relations News Service called Anti-Fascism or, or Anti-Extremism. Um, but I just wanted to start by saying that I read Aaron's book over the weekend and Aaron's just I mean there's so much in his book and he's actually had to focus today on a certain aspect of it but what frightened me in his book more than anything was the cases of entrapment and the cases of the use of police informers to actually create plots that wouldn't have happened to destroy people's lives, to shove people in, in maximum security, solitary confinement or kill them, and that's absolutely shocking. And on what Asim has just said, I mean, this whole question of channel and prevent, this isn't soft policing. This is, I mean, this is a massive extension of the scope of our criminal justice system into people's private lives. And I think at the Institute of Race Relations, we've been looking at Islamophobia for the last 10 years, let's say, and we've always looked at it as the creation of a separate criminal justice system beyond the ordinary rule of law. And I think what I've learned from reading Aaron's book and from listening to the scene is actually we've moved to something completely different. We're actually looking at this separate criminal justice system actually invading. It's like this, this weed which is invading the ordinary criminal justice system and actually creating systems that can now be extended to, to other communities. And so I think 
um, one thing that I think Aaron's done, which I'm really, really grateful, and I haven't thanked this again, I haven't thanked everybody, but I'd just like to thank Aaron for doing this really tedious, boring job of going through all this absolutely tedious anti-extremism. You're not selling my book, when you <laughs> <laughs> well, you make it exciting. You make it exciting. Because you, but I mean, it really is hard going reading that stuff. Come on, Aaron. It's, it is. It's, it's really tedious. So, what I want to sort of talk about is the way that the anti-extremism discourse is now being extended to other communities like the left community, the anti-fascist community, because, you know, we just only have to take a look around Europe and see what's happening with the austerity packages. Look at Greece, look at Cyprus. Uh, look everywhere, and there is massive discontent. There are more communities with grievances. And you have to have your eyes, you can't not see that the right to protest is, is under threat. It, you know, everywhere in Europe, the right to protest is under threat. You might be allowed to go to a protest, but you're going to be kettled. So, you know, that in itself is, is, is a complete um, denial of, of your civil rights. So it's not surprising that this anti-extremism discourse is now being um, applied to other communities. And <clears throat> I think, for me, the way that I understand anti-extremism now is that it's not just a policy or a program, it's not just prevent or channel, it's actually the defining narrative of our times. So it's like this false divider is being set up. It's like we're not divided by class, we're not divided by poverty, we're not divided by race, we're actually divided by the fact that some people are moderates and some people are extremists. And of course this is a complete nonsense. It's an absolute nonsense because anyone who's been around for a few years, like they're younger than us, I mean, we, you know, anyone with a sense of history know that this is just this ridiculous way of looking at the world. I mean, if we're going to go down this line, we might as well say that Herschel Greenspan, who was the, uh, the young Jewish uh, refugee who assassinated a Nazi official, that he was responsible for Kristallnacht, which was the first pogrom against the Jews in, in, in Nazi Germany, which was the start of the final solution. It's like, Ed, there's no cause and effect. Everything's just, it's like my handbag, I just throw everything in my handbag and see what comes out. All violence is the same, all, all, everything is, is exactly the same. And it's completely banal. I think the anti-extremism discourse is very, very banal. And when it comes to anti-fascism, what they're trying to do is to reduce anti-fascism to, to just the, the question of direct action. It's just the sort of set pieces, the fascist march, the anti-fascist march. Therefore, the fascists and the anti-fascists are the same. They're all part of cumulative extremism. But one of the benefits of working for the Institute of Race Relations for 30 years, and Aaron is, uh, uh, worked, worked at the Institute for 13 years, uh, before he went to New York, and he still works with us for race and class, is because you're connected. You're connected to the history. You're connected to the history of anti-racism and anti-fascism. We work with people who were in the 1960s fighting powerlessism, in the 1970s fighting at the National Front. We did these histories of South Hall and Newham and the community struggle against racism and fascism. But you know that anti-fascism is not just about direct action. Anti-fascism is a culture. It's an ethical movement that springs from the grassroots, if I'm allowed to say that, your person in who said that it's only his pop spoke about the grassroots, but it does, it springs from the grassroots, from the people up. And it's not just about fighting the Nazis on the street, it's actually about preventing democracy deteriorating into the ty tyranny of the majority. So what I've seen over the last few years is the way that the uh, anti-fascist movement has been criminalised in Europe. Um, in Greece, this plays out, you might have seen that there was a, a young anti-fascist rapper called Pavlos Pissas who was murdered by uh, a, a supporter of Golden Dawn. Golden Dawn had infiltrated the police, had infiltrated the army, they had how many, they had, I can't remember the exact number of MPs they had in Parliament. And this is the one thing that they don't want you to know. 
I mean, they talk about Islamic extremism, but where is there an Islamist party in any government, in any parliament in Europe, in any local parliament? The fascists are in every single, uh, in every single country, even if they're not in the parliament, they're actually in the local parliament. So they're actually capturing aspects of the state. No other, uh, you can talk of no other form of extremism in Europe today that is capturing the state. So in Greece, even though these fascists went around on motorbikes in convoys, attacking mostly uh, uh, migrants, and, uh, and, and then they moved towards attacking the left and killed Pavlos. Even though all this was happening, even though there was a section of the army who was preparing a coup, the narrative in Greece is the theory of the two extremes. So Golden Dawn and the uh, left party Syriza are seen as examples of the two extremes. In France, where you had another young anti-fascist killed a year or so ago called Clement Merritt, who was in the party of the left, um, he was actually killed by neo-Nazis. Uh, he was only, I think, 18 years old. And then there was in Parliament, there was a big debate about banning some of these neo-Nazi groups that was involved in his killing. And um, immediately Marine Le Pen got up and said, so I'm going to do a French answer. I must do that. This is selective dissolution. And if you're going to ban this party, then you have to ban the party of the left, which would have been the party of the, the young man who was killed. In Germany, they talk about two totalitarianisms, which means that you are uh, equally, it's looking at the history of the GDR, and so the, the Communist Party and the Fascist Party are the same. And, I mean, in fact, um, there's big, big uh, debate in Germany because the government brought in a, 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 a measure that if you were in an anti-racist group doing victim counselling, you wouldn't get any funding from the state unless you signed a declaration of loyalty that you accepted. Basically, you had to agree with the intelligence services definition of extremism. If you didn't agree with that definition of extremism, you couldn't be funded. Which is a bit like prevent in a way, isn't it? So a lot of groups actually refused to sign that declaration, and they put. I mean, if, if you didn't only if you were found to be even working with one individual who was considered an extremist, then you would have seen to have, seen to have broken your contract. And the groups who actually refused it made the point: well, well, we're working against Islamophobia. We're trying to protect the mosques in Berlin from being attacked. How can we do this work if you're going to say well, you can't work with this mosque, in, you know, etc.? In Sweden, the debate now is around all violence is the same. Now, this is just um, unbelievable because. If you look at the rise of the, uh, the whole question of Swedish fascism, by the way, I just want to mention, because I know you may have heard there have been a lot of arrests of people um, for, for uh, offences ar arising with going to Syria to fight. Well, actually, the one respite that our friends in the Roma community have now in the Czech Republic who are facing anti-Roma demonstrations this week is the whole of the far-right um, fascist scene have actually gone to Ukraine. And they're all serving in, they're in paramilitary squads in Ukraine. The Swedish intelligence services said, this isn't our issue. We're not concerned about this. We're looking at terrorism. This isn't terrorism. They have a right to do this. So anyway, in Sweden, where there's been a huge attack on the Nazis attached an anti-fascist demonstration very, very brutally, there was this massive debate about this 16-year-old woman who went to, um, actually went to a meeting where the leader of the Sweden Democrats was speaking, and she actually uh, pushed a, um, a cream cake into his face. And this was seen as an example of left-wing extremism and a massive threat to democracy, whereas nobody mentioned the fact that the fascists were marching every week as a threat to democracy. So this, this is my main point. It's completely banal. This actually. Um, oh, somebody else is asking. Sorry. No, go uh, ahead. Uh, fascinating talk. Thank you very much for all the speakers. Um, Aaron, I was uh, particularly uh, interested in one of your points, where you, the one you were saying where the liberals have adopted this language of moderate extremists. And I think that is how we've allowed people, for example, in the Labour Party, who used to be, for example, civil liberties lawyers, human rights lawyers, very similar people have gone into Parliament, there must be other pressures as well, no doubt, have ended up voting for some of the most draconian anti-libertarian legislation. And apart from obviously political sort of opportunism, 
I think also that point that you said about liberals being persuaded that these are extremist Muslims and the language of Islamofascism was linked with what you said about fascism. That's where they've been very successful in order to get the tacit approval of many people who I have thought in the past have probably shown a bit more uh, opposition to the laws and policies that have been practiced. I just want to talk on that to you. Um, why don't we yeah. get two or three questions and then we'll respond. But it might be worth responding to that while people think up questions. Sure, okay. I think um, get the ball rolling. I mean, I think, you know, one of the interesting things uh, uh, both in the United States and Britain um, is the way in which um, a political consensus has been created across the spectrum, right? So, um, you know, if it was just conservatives um, advocating for these kinds of policies, and um, uh, then, you, then you would not see what we see. Um, in the early years of the war on terror in America, it was, you know, you did have some kind of... Um, You'd have some kind of debate around this stuff. Um, I mean, albeit an odd debate, it's odd to have a debate about whether torture is legitimate. But you had a debate, in, and Democrats in America would, would take a stand against some of Bush's policies. Right? What happened with Obama coming in, having been elected on a, a kind of measure of opposition to the war on terror, particularly around the Iraq war, he then absorbed that sense of opposition from the American public into his administration and kind of new to them, right? And, um, and, and so while neoconservatives created the war on terror, liberals normalized it, right? And, um, uh, and, and so now it's just the common sense reflexes of how, you know, when we think about these questions about terrorism, extremism, kinds of policies that we should have in place, it's no longer a matter of a discussion, it's just this is, how we do things, it's just normal, it's just, you know, not even a, a debate. Um, and so, and, so and, and in order for that to happen, you need to be able to, you need to be able to present what you're doing, not as the, the mass demonization of all Muslims, but as something that is a little bit more subtle, and that involves partnerships with Muslims, and involves, um, you know, and involves, and you need to be able to use the language of, um, you know, of partnership, of integration, etc. Right, and that's what this particular liberal take does. Um, but the um, you know the concept of a moderate Muslim is kind of um, something that is very slippery. Right, so the, what it means to be a moderate Muslim is someone who um, you know who um, who keeps their religion in the private sphere, but then also has to speak publicly to condemn other people's interpretation of religion if it's supposed to be the wrong interpretation. So it's a public-private contradiction. It's someone who's supposed to put their kind of um, their capacity for individual reason above their faith, right? Um, but if that capacity for individual reason leads you to make criticisms of your government, then you're supposed to self-censor, right? So again, there's a contradiction there about about. Um, kind of the autonomy of your capacity for reason, um, and you're and you're supposed to denounce the use of violence if, uh, for political ends, unless the British government, or American government, uses violence for political ends, in which case you're meant to celebrate it. So you're in, but inevitably in this trap, right? And um, and that's why when you think about who are the people who get held up as moderate Muslims, they're always in this kind of ambiguous space where sooner or later someone comes along and says, ah, behind the mask of moderation, there's a closet extremist lurking, because. That's not about that person, it's about the way that the terms are set up. Right? Actually, sorry, just to add, I think that's probably one of the lessons from that organization street. So people like Abdul Haq Baker, who are very, very closely aligned to kind of a Saudi uh, and very pro-Saudi government version of Islam, who are totally co-opted by Prevent, and very much, especially in the Absolutely. early years, they, they actually helped to drive the prevent strategy within communities mm -hmm. end up getting burned quite badly mm -hmm. because somebody turns around and says, well, hold on a second, these guys are pretty, you know, pretty out there. They're very close to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia hates women, and hates the you know, Western way of life, and so on and so forth. And so literally they get publicly burned, you know, get all their funding taken away from them because they weren't able to negotiate that space because they, they allowed themselves to be co-opted by it and only then to then realize that actually we're not welcome at this table either. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions, <coughs> contributions? <coughs>
I think uh, modernized uh, you know, the extreme, extremism and you know, the, uh, terrorism you know, uh, were you know, the, uh, created by Tony Blair and George Bush because uh, if, uh, people in here are all, I think, educated, we know, we know. If, you know the Iraq, uh, since you know, 2001, that was you know, terrorist. I think I read some articles, you know. Uh, if uh, Saddam Hussein had you know, the, 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 the uh, weapons of the, you know, the what was it? The, mass the, yeah, mass, mass destruction. If that's why they didn't use you, there wasn't any that kind of the weapon. If you know, the demonstrate he didn't use you, you know. I think Tony Blair created too much causing trouble, honestly. And then now, ah, I'm peacemaker. Absolutely ridiculous. And then, you know, the, really, you know, the making sick, you know, the devil's. I met many times his, uh, you know, the uh, wife, uh, the celebrity, celebrity in the church here. Really, you know, the, I think, uh, he is causing trouble to avoid almost you know. There wasn't any mess destruction weapon in the world, mass destruction also, you know. He made the, the Syria also completely open, make a war civil war. All, you know, the, you know, the, make another you know, the, the travel. And then now the conservatives also wanted to go Syria for why? Now we are, education is now head, head down in, in you know, the industrial, the educational, the economic, really it's quite low compared to China or South Korea, Japan, you know. So why they don't invest more money to the young people in you know, education? Why they love to go into the world? Totally, utterly, you know, we don't understand, you know. That has to, you know, people have to you think know, about, you know. Also, the U.S. <coughs> also, you know, I read the some article. He's a Christian, you know, some Christian also more, you know, the violence. Yeah? The, the Christian also, there is a good Christian, bad Christian, all same. Or also some, you know, the majority of people are to them, you know. Not just one side is bad, you know. God never said, oh, hey, Tony Blair and George, you go to the European and kill the millions of people. No, God never said, you know. And uh, the, the Muslim and the Bible also, they never said the like that, you know. Just the people, the ideological, you know, you know, the Olympic Day, 1930s, the uh, Hitler went to the, the war because of the economic disaster in, in uh, Germany. That's why they go to the war. Now this country is also economically very low. That's why they want to go to the, you know, the war and then take it from the oil or something like that. Right? So we have to think about it, you know, the, not just the Christian is a good, Muslim is bad. I don't think, you know, like this, so we have to think about Christian. I'm Christian, you know, but some Christian, some minister is in you know, a very, you know, that's all in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before Aaron or the panel come back, are there any other contributions? Yes. Yeah. Um, we've all discussed the discourse of uh, extremism and highlighted that it's uh, quite complicated. Yeah. Could you speak up a little bit for the people yeah, in the back? Yeah, you, all, all, uh, all you have uh, highlighted the uh, the problematic discourse of uh, extremism and uh, how it's a complicated uh, concept. Uh, but when people... First of all, I wouldn't say that going to Syria for jihad is problematic in itself. Uh, there are some variations, but arguably when someone fights for an Al-Qaeda linked group, officially Al-Qaeda linked group, uh, as uh, Jabhat al-Nusra is, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a problem. Um, but yeah, that's m but my point is though, that uh, I agree that uh, there should be room for some extremism, uh, however defined in society. Uh, after all, that's how we've achieved change throughout the years. Um, but where should it um, be met and uh, how, when should we deal with it? Uh, a question for the whole term. Thank you. Thank you. One more before <coughs> the panel comes back on this. 
Okay, we'll come back on the first two. Um, would you like to start? Um, okay, well, I mean, you know, Tony Blair, um, I actually, I actually think there's something very interesting that, that most people haven't really understood about what was going on with Tony Blair um, as far as his reading of the war on terror is concerned. Um, he was very influenced by Bernard Lewis, the, um, uh, the British um, Orientalist scholar who, who then moved to America. Um, and, and when you look closely at how Tony Blair talks about the war on terror, and particularly how he talks about the Iraq war, he says the Iraq war was not about regime change, the Iraq war was about values change. Right? And the, the model seems to me to be a model in which he thought that um, the war on Iraq would, would be a way where you could erase the social fabric of that society and create on top of this kind of tabula rasa that would result a totally new, um, a totally new Iraq that would be on the model of American neoliberalism, right? And, um, and so the, the violence of the Iraq war was not a means to an end, but was, well, wasn't, it wasn't a means to an obvious end. The, the, it was a way to, to, to literally destroy the social fabric, right, in order to change the values of that society from scratch. And within, within that kind of neoconservative world of Bernard Lewis and others, um, there is a, you know, their analysis is that, is that the values of societies in the Middle East are are fundamentally problematic, and so either you have an authoritarian state that suppresses those values, um, or you have to do what you did in Iraq, which is to um, to raise them through violence, right? Um, and um, ultimately, that's the reason I think that that um, Tony Blair launched the war in Iraq, and the reason that the neoconservatives in America got Bush to, to um, do the war in Iraq. Right? It's a much, in a way, it's a much more sinister reason than you know, all this stuff that we talk about normally about weapons of mass destruction, um, humanitarian intervention, even the narrative that it was all for oil. Actually, it's much more sinister. Um, and, and you know, it's interesting watching the, um, the trial that's going to be going on later this year um, with regard to the Boston Marathon bombing that took place um, last um, April. Um, the, the surviving perpetrator is charged with using weapons of mass destruction right, um, for, for an explosive device that was made out of fireworks. Um, so we've redefined what weapons of mass destruction mean. No longer chemical, nuclear and biological weapons. Right? Um, it's something much wider. So it's almost as if, well, we didn't find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, but if we redefine the term, we'll find them everywhere. Right? Um, so, Syria, I will lead to... Um, yeah, I'm, yeah s s sorry, there's... No, 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 I'm cracking, please. No, you haven't cracked <laughs> it. I'll stick with you, Craig. You are, I'll probably... Have Shall we change around? Yeah. You can do Ukraine, you're not doing it. <laughs> no, 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 I'm glad to recognise the fact that going to Syria in and of itself isn't necessarily a problem. I'm not one to usually quote Barack Obama that much, but in the circumstance I will, where he even recognised for the first time that, you know, not all of al-Qaeda is the same. Sometimes the term and the name is appropriated, but in every single circumstance they are actually very different. And one of the things that we know on the ground um, is that actually all of the traditional hallmarks that we saw of Al-Qaeda in the way that it carried out both itself both ideologically and its ritual practice and so on and so forth, none of those seem to be there with this with the groups that are in the Sham in, in the Levant. So, you know, I think we need to start becoming more sophisticated in our understandings of political violence around the world, the context in which it's taking place and the way in which it manifests itself. I'm not saying wholesale that there is no problem there whatsoever. Okay, what I'm saying though is that every single circumstance is different. And what I've said about Syria all along is that actually the framework of terrorism in a civil armed conflict is not the one to apply. In fact, we have the second uh, additional protocol for the Geneva Conventions for a reason, okay, which is that when there's internal armed conflict, okay, what we do is that we apply that standard. And so you know, one of the things that we've been constantly saying is that if somebody commits a crime, like killing civilians, like kidnapping uh, journalists and so on and so forth. The Geneva Conventions can completely take care of nearly every single aspect of that because it's an armed conflict. Why are we introducing 
a new system of laws and, and replacing a, a, you know, that with this kind of framework that's never really traditionally existed and being applied into a circumstance that, that it should never be. Because we already saw that in Afghanistan. When they refused to apply the Geneva Conventions on those men, they were sent to Guantanamo. We saw the abuses that took place and we saw the amount that it actually fed into a grievance rhetoric after that. Guantanamo, there's never, there's never been a bigger poster boy for grievance against the Western world than Guantanamo. I've been to prisons that are far worse than Guantanamo. And you know what they say to me? They say to me, it's like we're in Guantanamo Bay. Because their frame of reference is, that's the worst place you could possibly imagine, even though it's not. And so it comes back to the same thing, that we've become so unsophisticated in the way that we, uh, that we assess political violence, that you know, we start you know, falling into this rhetoric of hysteria, which results in applying incorrect frameworks, which then leads to further abuses. Uh, I think the question um, at the front was also about the law and when we should apply the law to, to fight um, extremism, which is a word I don't want to use. Um, but just as I think we've become, we are unsophisticated in the way we understand political violence, I think we've become completely, the, the anti-terrorist laws have become normalised and accepted and that's the most frightening thing because anti-terrorist laws are by their very nature emergency laws. When they come in, we're told we're in a state. How many years have we been in a state of emergency? Since 1974. We're living in a country which is in, has been in a state of emergency since 1974. Since 1974. And I don't think that hardly anybody knows that we're living in a state of emergency. You can't live in a country in a state of emergency without that fundamentally eroding into the culture of democracy. So I. My answer to this is that we have enough laws in the ordinary rule of law without emergency laws. We have enough laws to deal with acts of violence. And that we should go back to the ordinary rule of law and we should go back to, to prosecuting acts, not thoughts and ideas. And even when it comes to things like conspiracy, because obviously if there is a conspiracy to create a, an act of terrorism, you want to feel the security services are going to stop that conspiracy before it happens. But there are conspiracy laws. Everything is there. We don't need emergency laws. I think it's quite coming back on that point. In the, the original Prevention of Terrorism Act in 1974 um, was introduced and it was designed to last for six months maximum because there was a recognition that this was indeed something almost too far for British law to, to enter into. And there was a concern, particularly among liberals, who, who were very concerned that the incursions into human rights, that the uh, emergency legislation, the Prevention of Terrorism <coughs> Act would um, incur, uh, was something that in Britain we, we weren't prepared to tolerate. And it's so interesting today to see how easily we tolerate um, <clears throat> precisely the kinds of incursions <coughs> into human rights and civil liberties that um, those liberals then were um, trying to resist. Any other questions, contributions? Anja? Um, the, the last person to be put on the FBI's most wanted terrorist list was Asata Shakur, um, Tupac Shakur's. Um, Godmother, I think. And um, last week we also saw the release of Eddie Conway, who I think was in prison for over 40 years, mm. the current opera. I was just wondering what said the uh, war on terror can be considered an organic growth of earlier wars on a black liberation movement. It's in the book. You know, I think I think the the um, you can trace a history here, right? There's a number of strands to it, but one of the strands is um, a strand that runs from um, COINTELPRO into the into the FBI's counterterrorism policies after 9-11. Um, I think um, COINTELPRO used informants, um, it used um, entrapment, it used agent provocateurs, um, and, and so there's a, 
a very basic continuity in terms of the um, in terms of the very specific ta policing tactics um, that you see now that the FBI uses. The FBI, as of um, 2008, has um, 15,000 paid informants um, in the United States. Um, it, we don't know how many of those are, are based in American Muslim communities, but um, it's reasonable to assume that, that more than 50% are given that, that um, more than 50% of the FBI's budget is dedicated to counterterrorism. Um, and counterterrorism is, is more or less defined as, as Muslim terrorism. So, um, and we know from some of the prosecutions that have emerged that um, that those informants are being placed in mosques, in um, Muslim student associations, Muslim communities.